Hello, I am Valerie Worthington, and I'm happy to be here as part of the Valcast, which is part of a bigger effort called Grappling with Answers, where we come together uh, jujitsu professionals who also do other amazing things. And today I'm so thrilled to get the opportunity to talk to Dr. Jasmine Constanzo, who's going to talk with us about um, the virus, about testing, about vaccines, about reopening, and about self-care, um, among many, many other things. Um, Jasmine, thank you so much for being here today. The first thing I wanted to ask you is if you'd be willing to say a little bit about your jiu-jitsu background and your current involvement in jiu-jitsu. Well, thank you for having me. I started training in 2005 with a former Navy SEAL. And I was very lucky to be a part of a fusion school where we did weapons work, we threw each other around, we did a lot of grappling and internal work as well. So I studied with him for several years while I was at Dartmouth. And then I switched to the MMA lab where we did mixed martial arts and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And I'm still training today with Dave Camarillo. And I spent many years since 2010 with Marcelo Garcia. And I got my brown belt a couple of years ago. Wonderful. Um, and in addition to your busy martial arts schedule, you also have a very busy educational and professional background. And I was wondering if you could say a little bit about that as well. Yes, ma'am. So I majored in chemistry when I graduated undergrad, and then I went off to graduate school in organic chemistry. And I actually was getting quite sick from the organic molecules that were meant to be drug designed for anti-cancer drugs. So I had a bit of a reckoning about what my life would look like. And as somebody who really believed in diet and exercise and wellness, I knew that drugs were certainly very important for chemotherapeutics and other life-saving interventions, but I wanted more information. And as a small child old enough to reach an arm, I would take the proximal and distal ends of radius and ulna and try to find a point of balance. So I knew that I wanted not only to know when a patient's really sick, if a baby needs an IV and intravenous drugs and if somebody's having a heart attack, but also how to keep people out of hospitals and keep them very well and have a great quality of life where they're able to move, their structure and function is aligned and they're able to operate with the maximum efficiency and feeling good in their bodies. So I went through a process of changing to a molecular biology and immunology lab at Dartmouth Hitchcock, where I was very blessed to learn with them. And then I went to study biomedical sciences in Arizona and we're in the process of getting accepted to medical school. I graduated in 2012, and then I did a residency in the Bronx at a level one trauma center. So after intern year where we were in the emergency room, the pediatric emergency room, internal medicine, uh, ICU, all of the places throughout the hospital, then we went to specialize in neuromusculoskeletal medicine, again, with all the pre and post-op surgical patients, all the ob gyn patients and all the children. So after that year of learning all of the medicine, again, after rotating for two years as a medical student, then we went through and did it again as a doctor. And so now I'm in private practice in California after being a full-time professor and also having a private practice in New York City. I, I'm by no means a doctor, but one of the things that strikes me about um, listening to you talk about your professional experience and your personal interests is just how endless, probably how endless um, the landscape is. I mean, the human body is just fascinating and there's just so much uh, to explore and it probably never gets boring. Um, unfortunately, in some ways that manifests itself as um, disease. And as I don't need to tell you or anyone, we're experiencing a pandemic right now. And I was wondering if you could share a little bit about what your experience is like nowadays, what you're seeing with your patients and uh, from, your, from your professional medical perspective. Definitely. So as we're talking about jujitsu and we're talking about the endless landscape of physiology, I think that we're all very grateful for our natural inherent arsenal of protectors. We have B cells, we have T cells, we have natural killer cells. We have all of these helpers inside of us really working nonstop to keep us healthy. So having said that with a lot of gratitude, uh, we, we do have a lot of hope on the horizon. So we'll definitely talk about what's important with regard to my current medical practice. The first few weeks of the shelter in place, it was trying really hard to keep people out of the emergency room. So the anxiety levels were so high. People were presenting with abdominal pain and they felt like there wasn't anybody to help them. And I was getting calls and video conferences. I'm very sick, I need to go to the emergency room and nobody will be able to help me in a clinic. 
and I had there's this pandemic going on so there was a lot of education on my part to help people understand that if they went to the emergency room they would be much more likely to contract COVID because that would in fact be a place where the sick people would be going and that there is help there's many doctors who are making themselves more available to take care of people and we've been trained since our first day of rotations as a third year medical student to recognize sick and not sick so the people who are really sick and this is important people who are having shortness of breath chest pain those people need to go to the emergency room a lot of other things we can manage outpatient and so getting in contact with a doctor to really understand your symptoms before going to the emergency room so we keep the emergency rooms free for people who really are having acute respiratory distress that's of critical importance and we have done a good job of preventing things like trauma so one of the main things that come in are motor vehicle accidents and other traumas which is lessen the load for emergency medicine practitioners so that that's not coming through so that they can focus on the people who are really ill um, so for me i've got to dwell more into the general medicine side of things which has been very rewarding and there's so much that we've had to evolve through as private practitioners and i think to be calm and grounded in my science and medicine knowledge and to be able to give people good information about how to prevent the illness and stay well and if they do get sick, what we will do next to prevent the community at large, it's been wonderful to have all of that knowledge. And um, my patients have been really responsible. And I'd like to share that information with you as we go along in this interview. Yeah, that's fantastic. And um, we will definitely um, share some of the resources that you've that you've compiled on your website, which is which is wonderful. So when it comes to the typical person who may be experiencing anxiety, may be wondering, is that, you know, is that symptom something that I should be concerned about? What are some best practices that the, the typical individual can carry out uh, to keep themselves as safe as possible and, um, and to be as informed as possible in terms of when it would be appropriate to seek medical help and when, when they, can, they can just um, be on their own? Certainly. I want to take a step back and acknowledge that the anxiety levels are very high and everybody is struggling. We're very lucky in this country that we can isolate from each other in some places in India that's not an option. So we have a lot to be thankful for. In that same token, it's understandable. People are in economic crisis. We don't know how things are going to go. And so first recognizing I'm having anxiety. That's huge because that brings you not in the past, not in the future of how you're going to pay. I'm in my body. Where am I feeling it? I'm having anxiety. Now we can look at our breath. Where in our body is our breath? Can we invite it to be a little bit longer, a little bit deeper? That is huge. And then we're able to assess. Part of the problem with having the anxiety level so high is it's hard to make good decisions. And I saw this the first day that the announcement for shelter in place would happen. People were blowing lights opening their car doors in the middle of the streets, walking into each other and not thinking about the best thing I could do to protect myself is to stay six feet away from another individual beyond masks. So the first thing is to stay safe, stay six feet away. I know anxiety levels are high and that leads to rushing and not really thinking. You will be much more safe if you can honor that distance and it's quite a distance. And if that means you're walking and you have to calculate your route, please think about that. So it's like a mindfulness practice, which takes some cultivation. But if you can think about, I don't want whatever's going on with their face, near my face. And whatever's going on with my face, they probably don't want that near them. They could be a survivor from cancer. They could have immunosuppressant drugs on board. They could be growing human. So honoring each other's rights to be a little bit far, if we can do that, that would be very important. We've seen how important hand washing has been and time matters. Happy birthday to your favorite person twice, your favorite metal song, whatever it is, getting in between the digits is very important. As jujitsu practitioners and doctors, we keep our nails very short. Keeping that practice is very good because we need to get underneath the nails, honoring the nail beds a little bit, and definitely the thumbs because we use our thumbs for so many things. And uh, we're all tired of hearing it, but not touching the face. And it's hard to understand the why, but I think that if humans understand the why they will stay away from each other they will wash their hands for the appropriate amount of time and they'll train themselves not to touch their face because whatever viral particles are there that's your transmission so it's actually having some ownership some responsibility it's your hands to your face that's bringing it to the entryway into your respiratory tract so 
we have to train ourselves not to do that and be vigilant about hand washing. And that's going to go so far in protecting individuals, but especially give people space. Give people space when you're driving, when we're texting and driving, that's very dangerous and more people are attached to the phone now more than ever. So put the phone away, pay attention, do defensive driving when we start driving again, because everybody's anxiety levels are very high and it's hard to make calm, good decisions when anxiety levels are high like that. It's, it's a reminder that we, the, there are only certain things that we can control. It's like the serenity prayer, right? Recognizing what we can control and letting go of the rest. Um, and I know that's easier said than done to your point about how anxious people are. Um, I'd like to pivot a little bit. The reason that we're doing all of these things is because right now, um, a lot of times we don't know who is infected. We don't know um, a lot about uh, reinfections, et cetera, et cetera. And so, um, can you say a little bit about the, the status of testing for the virus, where that stands right now, um, and what sort of the typical person needs to know about that? Certainly. Going back to this virus, I stopped seeing patients in person long before the shelter in place. Um, my elder colleague, who is a cancer survivor with an immunosuppressed wife, he stopped seeing patients a couple weeks before the shelter in place, and he warned us in November that this was coming. So there was a time frame to prepare the PPE, there was a time frame to prepare the testing, and a lot of things happened in that time frame. So having said that, the virus was here. We've had international individuals from all over the world in November, in December, people were getting sick with viral-like COVID typical presentations way back in November, December, January, February, March. Now in April, we started to have a little bit of testing. Now we're in May. So if we're thinking that we're going to be able to model, even with the best test that was completely perfect, which we don't have, and I'll talk about that, we've missed all that data. We don't have it. So we definitely have some data from around the world that's helping us, and I'm very thankful for the international scientists for sharing that with us. We don't have that data, so that's number one. Um, number two, there are more tests and they're becoming more available. Where you live, for example, Tennessee, has a very good availability of tests. The people going to take those tests are the more responsible individuals who are keeping the distance and washing their hands and really taking advantage to be isolated and giving that information. So a lot of the people who are wanting testing are, I'm curious if I have it, um, I want to know, I want answers. And those aren't necessarily the symptomatic population who are living in close quarters who would be more vectors. So our population is also skewed with the testing. Um, does all of that make sense? I want to get into the context of what the science is. So as I go into the science, please stop me if I get too much in that realm. So if somebody is symptomatic or they've been exposed to somebody with symptoms, so a dry cough, a fever, muscle aches that aren't jujitsu muscle aches, and then they're experiencing, oh, my coffee or my beer just doesn't taste or I'm not smelling, that's another very good indication. Um, or anything where they're having a headache that's not unlike other headaches, they just feel generally unwell. The virus affects systematic, the whole system of the body. So any systemic changes, we wanna know about that. So they go in, they could get a nasopharyngeal swab or they could have their throat swabbed or even now we could have saliva. So we take a sample from that and then we do something called RT-PCR and that will see if the genetic material of the virus is present. Several things with that, you have to catch it at the right time, and there has to be enough viral load to be able to be amplified through the PCR to show us positive. If we get that, we know that you have the virus and you can infect others. What I would say in that, if you think that you will infect others, if you've had a sick contact, if you're even a little bit, I don't feel great, please isolate yourself for the two weeks. Having said that, not everybody could do that economically in their world, they need to survive. So, but if you can do that, please do that. So a combination of getting the test, but also being very vigilant about our symptoms is super important. Now there's another test that will test our immune response. So that's an antibody response. And we have the shorter term, which is called IgM, and a longer term, which is IgG. And these tests will have a control similar to a pregnancy test. So you have to make sure that the control is there to make sure that the test is working. And then if you have the IgM, you're going to be able to contaminate people with this virus. And again, you should isolate. 
uh, if you have the IgG, then you have antibodies to some virus that we don't know how long they will last for. Hopefully they will measure for a while. Um, the World Health Organization mentions two years on average for a coronavirus antibody, which is great news. And so we're hoping that that will be protective against the coronavirus. Uh, we don't know for how long. And then there is also cross-reactivity. There are many viruses. Just because we have a pandemic doesn't mean that other viruses go away. And so there, you could have a positive IgG, which is the long-term response to a different virus that gives you protectiveness, but it's not necessarily specific for that version of coronavirus. And it gets complicated because viruses are famous survivors because they mutate. But we're famous survivors because we adapt. So if your IgG, which is the long-term antibodies, is negative, that doesn't mean that you can't still mount a response to the coronavirus. It also doesn't mean with certainty that you didn't have the virus, fight it off, and those antibodies are gone because you said, okay, thanks for helping. We don't need you at this moment, but we have a memory of it. And when we need you again, you'll come back. So that's a lot to consider. Can I answer more questions in there with um, making anything more clear? So this is extremely helpful in terms of, um, of saying exactly what the tests do and who should seek them. The question after that then becomes, given what the tests do and don't tell us, what's the next step for going back to quote unquote normal? And we'll talk about that as well. But, but if I take the test and I test negative, what does that mean for my capacity to go back to a quote unquote normal life? Certainly. I want to go back and say also that people who one, wanted to get tested and didn't have the ability and two, were symptomatic and were being encouraged not to come get tests because they would infect other people. So since we weren't equipped to handle this pandemic, the priority was keeping people safe and not causing more cases of the virus. So now that we have more answers and we have more tests, we can get tested and have some data about things. So I think that there is a temptation in these scary times to say, I want an answer, so I have a yes or no decision. And we have to every day use the beautiful complex brains that we were given to assess, do we have any symptoms? Is the person that we're going to be contacting immunocompromised? And I have this test, but what does the data from this test mean? And the tests were complicated because to get the test doesn't mean that we would change the management. What if I have COVID? A lot of patients ask me. If you had COVID, I told them, we're going to keep you at home. We're going to give you lots of fluid. We're going to manage you at home. We're still going to isolate you. If you go to the hospital, they're going to send you home. And if you didn't have COVID when you walked into the emergency room, your chances of getting it are much higher now. So it doesn't change the management. And kind of the complication with getting tests is when we get a test, it's because we're going to change the management. If my Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu colleague comes to me because they hurt their knee, I'm not going to order an MRI unless I'm considering surgery. If we're going to rehab them outpatient and make the quadriceps stronger and work on their mobility of the lumbar spine, why would I introduce them to a complicated test if we're not going to change the management? But we need that data. So one of the resources on that list is a home delivery serological test where you could send in the antibodies to Washington. So if you have those, they're compiling the database so that we understand what's going on. And as scientists, as clinicians, as responsible citizens, we have to clean up this data. And we are. There's brilliant people all over the world working on getting this. So any data that we have is important. We also have to be really careful about what's in front of us clinically. One of the things I appreciate about the way you're explaining this, Jasmine, is your um, you're talking about the science, but you're also keeping in mind the broader context, which is that you know each case of coronavirus or each um, each person who's being asked to stay home, these are people, right? These are people who have lives and who have livelihoods. And what would you say to someone who um, either distrusts the science or has has challenges or is is frustrated in terms of um, what's being asked of them? in order to keep themselves safe and other people safe. Yeah, so meeting others, especially those with different viewpoints with compassion, is important. So if we were able internationally to come together to really put this virus in check, that would be very beneficial for getting our economy back, 
for getting the shelter in place lifted. So I think that we all have a similar goal. We want good economies. We don't want people to get sick. And I think educating people about that, if, if they're willing, would be the best case scenario. So this is a very different virus. Uh, a lot of people think about pulmonary illness, which is true. There's an affinity for ACE2 receptors, which are in type 2 alveolar cells in the lungs, but this disease affects the whole body. And it behaves in interesting ways. It causes a hypercoagulability that can be quite deadly. And a lot of people who are being intubated and on ventilators didn't expect that they would ever be in that situation. So for the people who think that they won't get sick, I promise you, the virus does not care about your belief system. It needs you as a host to replicate its RNA and it will come whether you believe in it or not. You know, so it's not, it's not Santa Claus. It doesn't mind if you don't believe in it. So it, it will rep use your body to replicate and people, especially people with hypertension, obesity, diabetes, pre-existing heart conditions, these people can get very sick because they're in an inflammatory hypercoagulable state all the time. So their outcomes can be quite worse. And there's very surprising cases of people with strokes with very bad outcomes who we would never think would get that sick. So please keep your face six feet from other people's faces. If you wanna live in a society where you have groceries and support from a government, put on your mask if you're going to be at the grocery store. I recommend if you have to go for groceries, please stay far away right after wash your hands. And then if you want to take your mask off, wash your hands again. So really doing that diligently is going to keep them safe. And whatever somebody believes, I don't want them to get sick. There is really irrefutable evidence that one person goes to a nightclub in South Korea and 54 people get sick. So please, you wouldn't want that on your mind, that you got 54 other people sick. Maybe somebody who's immunocompromised, maybe somebody who has children and then that child gets sick. I can't imagine anybody wanting to be responsible for that. So for a little while, until we figure out how to get this more under control with great science, let's stay a little bit far from each other. Let's cultivate that mindfulness of just, you want your respect, you want your individual rights to be honored. So respect somebody else's individual rights and keep your face away from their face, unless they explicitly invite you into their face. But then, you know, you reconsider. Right. So speaking of speaking of good science, um, what can you say about um, the the development of vaccines? Yeah, vaccines for viruses are tricky, and we talked about the mutation. And viruses are great at surviving. On a hopeful note, viruses want to survive, so they couldn't survive if they killed all the hosts. And as we mentioned, we have that beautiful arsenal of protectors inside of our body helping us. So it's not just the vaccine, there's also different pathways. So we have a, the S protein of the virus binding in a certain way with our cell receptors, and then we have certain shapes, and then we have the, I don't wanna to get too into the science, but we have many different ways of protecting ourselves. And so the best drugs and the best vaccines would try to consistently mimic that. And there's wonderful and prolific science happening from brilliant minds. Vaccines and good science take time, and we have to make sure it's safe. And there has to be good controls, there has to be good random controlled trials to make sure that it's better than placebo. And some of the antiviral research that's coming out is really good, but it, we haven't seen a decrease in the viral load in hospitals. So if somebody comes to the hospital, they have a viral illness, we can take their blood and see how high their viral load is, but we don't know where on the curve we got them. Was it higher when we took that moment in time snapshot? So where is it on the trend? So we have to trend it. But drugs that are antiviral, we have to get them early on in the illness. So the, these interventions have to happen safely and they have to happen at a time where it's going to really affect the body and they have to cover the mutations that the virus is going to do to survive because viruses are great at that. But we're great at adapting too, so. Absolutely, so it's, a, it, it's an adapting contest. <laughs> Um, so people talk a lot, myself included, about when things go back to normal. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could say a little bit about what normal is going to look like, because if I stop and think about it, 
then I have to I have to ad admit or to recognize that maybe normal doesn't exist anymore, at least not the way we knew it. So could you say a little bit about what you, what you think normal is going to look like in the future? At the risk of getting existential, when we learn how to take uh, blood pressure or listen to a heart or lungs, I was taught never to say that's normal. This is healthy and well. So uh, I have a resistance to the word normal in general because, so I think that if we adjust our expectations that there, we can't go back to before this pandemic. This virus is not going to disappear because we magically wish that it would. As we expose ourselves to each other and start to open up the country, there will be more cases. As we get more efficient testing, there will be more cases. How do we manage that? And I think we have to be more mindful. We can't not be mindful and expect that we will get the pandemic under control. So going back to your question about the people who are resistant to following the rules, there's big risk, and this is happening in countries around the world, that if you reopen too soon or you don't take precautions, that there's an even more intense spike, and then places have to shut down again, which goes in the opposite direction of growing the economy and the health of the nation, which we really, really want. So we have to be careful about this because the number of ventilators in hospitals are limited. I could tell you as somebody who worked nights in a trauma bay that things could go from manageable to not manageable very quickly. The same in the ICU, everybody's stable and all right. One person crashes and needs to be intubated. Another person needs CPR and a code. Things get very bad very quickly. So we're talking about one to three patients making a big difference in the quality of care that a whole floor and a whole region gets. So this is a reality. These are things that happen to patients and that's somebody's mother, that's somebody's whole life, their whole spouse, that's somebody's son or daughter. And so keeping our face away from each other and washing our hands and being responsible saves lives because we only have so many doctors, we only have so many ventilators. And I promise you, they're all working really hard and around the clock right now with not enough PPE with not enough sleep, with definitely not enough pay, with astronomical student loans. And they studied a minimum, a minimum of eight years to help people. So if you have questions, we're available to you. I'm available to you to help at this time more than ever, because this is the best thing we can do is to keep ourselves healthy. Walk for half an hour so that your heart gets good circulation, so that your diaphragm's moving, so that you can drain lymphatics appropriately. If your blood sugar's a little bit on, you know, a little bit high, your hemoglobin H1C, your primary said, I don't like that. Now is the time, because your blood vessels don't do well when your blood sugar is high. Things accumulate, and it's like trying to get through a tunnel with cars overturned everywhere. That makes the blood supply more turbulent. That leads to things blocking the arteries. That leads to things traveling in a chaotic fashion where they shouldn't to the brain and to the heart. So get the blood pressure under control, get your blood sugar under control, get your cholesterol under control, move your body. Uh, this isn't most jujitsu people, but some, some jujitsu people. And be, be mindful. If you go back to society and somebody's sick, then maybe you can't see your folks who are over 65. Maybe you can't see somebody who's on an immunosuppressant drug who, or who has chemotherapy in the past. So we talked about the sexual exposure in a way because it's almost like you're exposed to everybody that that individual has been exposed to. And as a physician, I have to be really careful about who I'm exposed to because then I don't want to infect a patient asymptomatically who I've sworn to protect you know, with my life in the best care possible. That's my life's goal. So that's the most important thing. And I will challenge everybody to be an ambassador of mindfulness and kindness, not only to yourself, this is hard. Can I take five big diaphragmatic breaths, figure out what the situation is, where do I walk, what do I need, what's happening in my body, but also really taking care of each other because we're saving lives as doctors and you're also saving lives by doing self-isolation. So thank you for that. So when you were talking about taking deep breaths, I could feel my I could feel my breath deepen. <laughs> so just saying it to yourself, I think really, you know, can help with that. One of the things that strikes me is that what you're describing doesn't sound conducive to doing jujitsu, which is a very close quarters, um, exchanging literally of bodily fluids type of activity. And um, jujitsu isn't uh, it isn't life or death. 
necessarily, but it's something that's really, really important to, <laughs> I saw it, <laughs> but it's something that's very, very important to people, both in terms of their livelihoods, but also in terms of their, their sense of self. Mm -hmm. Can you say any, can you talk a little bit about what, what you think it will look like, in, um, what the conditions will have to be um, in order for jujitsu to be a safe activity once again? A lot of people are publishing a lot of really good things about this, and I'm, I'm impressed and pleased about it. To protect small business owners, I want to start by saying you have to follow whatever's happening in your region. Follow those laws. Uh, I think that people will do jujitsu regardless, so I just want to put that out there because I really want the small business owners to be in a safe and healthy place. I don't want anyone to get in trouble. So if we can avoid the underground bike clubs, that would be ideal. So we've had to follow the law as citizens. Number one, I'm saying that. And number two, I think that we have to adjust our expectations about people getting sick as we start training because there's no avoiding it. I do think it will happen. And calibrating for that reality is really important. So having people be responsible. If I were a small business owner, I would have them sign a waiver. So if I'm going to do jujitsu, I commit to not going to a restaurant with more than 10 people to not going to a bar when they open, to not going to parties. And that sounds very warrior monk dire, but it's so important. If we want to keep jujitsu healthy, we have to make that commitment to train. And also if I'm going to train, I probably won't see my parents if they're over 65. I probably won't see anyone who is immunocompromised. I'm going to take extra precautions whenever I'm out. Also, if you can train with your family member who you live with, that's better because then you're not providing a new exposure. If you can't do that, having one, only one training partner, and I know it's sad because this woman has a great lasso guard, this person is such a good wrestler, we learn so much from training with different people, it's really important for now, until we are in a better space, one person, and that's it. And other things like temperature checks, it's data, it's not 100%. People don't always have fever, but if you have a thermometer, you can take your temperature every day. Women who are tracking their ovulation do this, everything. First, day, first time in the morning with a calibrated thermometer, you take your temperature. You could take it again in the car so that you're not having a bottleneck as you enter the academy and you don't have an elevated temperature. It's not enough. You have to monitor, did I have a weird headache? Did I feel chills and my body kind of hurt and I felt bad? Was my digestion doing weird things that I can't correlate to food? Um, and of course, the cough is more prevalent and the famous, very obvious symptom. If I had a sick content, if anybody sick that I contacted in my life, I'm not going to go train for two weeks. And I think that we have to be ambassadors in this way for jujitsu, because if we could do this well, we could show a lot to the country about reopening the economy. If we do this poorly, however, we could be penalized and there could be a lot of heat on small business owners and jujitsu all around the world. And we don't want that. We want to be able to train. So being patient in this time where you have your one training partner, where you're vigilant every day about your symptoms, even keeping a little log. I felt this. I had a temperature. Clearing it with a doctor, perhaps talking to your instructor about it. If you can stay six feet away at the academy, that's really important. Of course, keeping the distance as you're entering the academy and on the stairs, that's really important. We also have to calibrate for our feelings of restlessness because we've all been inside and sheltered in place. And there's the meme going around for, there's like a cute animal and a flower. It's like, I get the grips of my partner. I'll never let you go. <laughs> and I think a lot of us will be like that. Hugs are safer than handshakes. I feel like I've never liked handshakes as a physician. That's like, I, I know bodies and I know hands and I'm very glad that people are having awareness that we, we don't need to shake hands. Um, so I think that as soon as you get to the academy, you have to make sure that you wash your hands very diligently. Happy birthday to your favorite person twice. All the finger beds, the thumbs, really being careful about that. And then you only touch your training partner. You don't touch your phone. You don't touch your face. Uh, you'll probably touch their face at times, but if you touch their face, try not to touch your face. Wash your hands and shower as soon as you can afterwards. Uh, congregating in the locker rooms is a problem. Traveling from the academy to your next place is a problem if it's transit related. We're luckier in many parts of the world where we can just go in our car, disinfect the car handle, disinfect the steering wheel, go home, shower, wash everything, and then you can touch your face and hug your partner and everything. But 
don't obviously hug your partner with your gi, you know, so medical professionals, what I would do as soon as I got home, get out of the scrubs, shower right away. And that would be before training or before contacting my roommates or anything else. So something similar to that in jujitsu, where if you have, you're lucky enough to have space for a garage or as soon as you get through the door in our apartments in New York, right to the shower. What other questions about that? No, it's it, it all makes perfect sense. And I'm wondering if, if these guidelines are available for people anywhere or for small yeah. business owners. So, um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I wanted to address one other thing, please, if I may, uh, regarding class size. So it's really important, and I know it's so tough in New York City and other big cities. All around the world, they're talking about less than 10 people and then having the six feet between the 10 people. So if my partner comes to train with me at Dave's, we're six feet away from him and his wife training, and we ha we've really not exposed more. So that's okay, that's four people. So maybe we can get a couple more couples in there. And if you have to decrease the time for class to let people come in for more live training and then you keep holding your Zooms, things will get better, I believe. I believe as the weather gets better, viruses are very famous for proliferating when we're, it's winter time. And there's the humans in close proximity with each other. And they're like, oh, it's a fiesta. So we get to spread human to human, it's so good. So as we're outside and we're healthier and we're walking around, taking care of our immune system, eating vegetables, drinking water every hour, as we're doing all of those things, uh, we're, our bodies are healthier and we don't tend to have severe viruses in the past, but this is a whole different ballgame. So the less than 10 people, and, and I know in some places it's very tough, that's very important. What kinds of resources are available for people who want to educate themselves about um about staying healthy, like you said. And also, there are some people who may have a little bit of bandwidth. You you see a lot of people on social media taking pictures of masks that they've made, or uh, people are donating to various food banks, et cetera, et cetera. So if, if you want more information about how to stay healthy and or more information about how to, how to contribute, how to support people who may not have um, as many resources as you do, where are some places people can go? Yeah. Right. I think that the best thing we can do for the world is taking care of our health, eating healthy food, drinking water, moving our body every day. This is the best time, right, that we've ever had to do self-care. And we're learning that humans are interrelated. I, before reading a particular article, didn't realize that people in rural China were living right next to bat caves. That wasn't in my reality. So we're really learning that our health is affecting others' health in this time. So as a physician, as someone who cares about wellness, I would say taking care of yourself, number one. Your own oxygen mask first, so important. If you can feed others, there's the first resource under giving is how to get food to food banks. If you just go shopping and you get some extra and you drop it at a food bank, that's a huge help. PPE is still a problem. Homemade masks do help small clinics. And there are healthcare providers who don't have the N95s and the shield that they need. I'm in contact with them to get the mask directly. There's also donor and recipient websites for those, which is very wonderful, to get them the mask as soon as possible. And that is time dependent. Every day that a healthcare practitioner doesn't have a mask really affects them. I'm good friends with two women who are emergency medicine physicians, both who have two small children. They've gotten very sick from this and they didn't have proper PPE. So this is a real problem. And of course, hospitals with their volume of patients go through them quickly. And New York City is where we really need them. So I can help get masks there and I have resources for that. And donating blood is very important, particularly if you have any of these antibodies, this long term, the IgG we discussed, two viruses. If you can donate blood, that's very important. And there's a link there for making an appointment so that they're ready for you. You're social distancing, you're six feet. You walk, you take big breaths, you stay away from everybody, you get your blood drawn, you both have masks, and then you know you eat your wonderful broccoli and other build, blood building materials, and then you drink a lot of water and you're good for the day. So blood donations are always very important and they're very important now. Uh, grapevine.org, if you're more interested in donating money, you could donate to the cause that's very exciting to you. I posted something this morning about Native American communities who are really struggling. A lot of 
places to live on the reservations don't have running water, so it's very hard for them to get the proper hand washing, and then there's close proximity. So there are populations that are doing much worse, that can't social distance, who are living in poor living conditions, uh, who are hit harder because of comorbidities, for example, hypertension and heart disease in African American communities. So if you're excited to give to that, that's very important. And um, I would say if you have a small business in your neighborhood, if you have an art store that you really love and that makes you excited to do, do that. Uh, there's no one, I think, judging you for that cause isn't as good as another cause. So I think that your greatest joy right now, which is really important in these times, give where you feel most excited. And we, we want you to give where you feel most excited. So grapevine.org helps you to get the money to the place that really inspires you and you feel good about it. That's where it's going to have the most synergistic effect. And in addition to grapevine.com, you also have some resources on your website, which is jasmineohm.com, and it's your name, Jasmine, and O-M-M, -M, all one word, dot com. What, um, what have I not asked you, Jasmine, that you think it's important for people to know from your professional perspective? Yeah, yeah I, th I think that we covered a lot of the things that we wanted to cover. This is a complex illness and we're working hard to learn more about it every day. And it's really hard to develop mindfulness in this time when so much is going on. It's really the way through. This light at the end of the tunnel is the more that we can think about, all right, well, so I'm staying home because I'm forced to stay home, but where's the why? If I wear a mask and my nose is not covered, why, why bother, right? So we're going to stay away from each other. We're going to wear a mask properly if we can't maintain proper distance. We're going to really wash our hands. We're going to focus on our health. We're going to do all these things so that at the end of this really challenging, rough sea that we're coming out a better sailor, if you will. So um, we know this from training together. The really tough training partners help us advance to the next degree. So I'm hoping as humanity we can do this and really have understanding that our health affects everybody else's health and rise up and do the things we need to do to be even better as a world together. And I, I appreciate that. I appreciate your emphasis on how what we do individually really does have reverberations. It really does make a difference. Um, and, and so hopefully that will help some people feel more um, empowered help them feel more like what they're doing makes a difference because as you're saying, it all does, it all matters. Yeah. I, I think that I, I keep seeing the locked frequencies in a gyroscope and before we invented lasers, the people who are navigating had to really shake the gyroscope mechanically to get things moving. And so we have the chemical environment, which we could help with inflammation, decreasing inflammation, moving our body, eating good food. We have the mechanics, getting our ribs and our diaphragm aligned um, but as we're aligning our diaphragm, we also have to think about what other things in our life need changing. I think this has been a wonderful invitation to, you know, I didn't like driving two hours a day. Um, what are my finances doing? Do I need to have this high of an overhead when I don't have income? So it's less of that circular benzene of the snake chasing its own tail. What can I manage to make my life simpler and better? So it's a little bit hard to get out of that frequency when we're in the same pattern. So since things have been so different, this is a time if you wanna make a change, if you really wanna get your blood sugar under control, if you really wanna get out of a relationship or have a better relationship with yourself, this is a wonderful opportunity to change things because the energy is so different. So these things also take time. It's not always so fun to like, oh, wait, well, 30 minutes of walking, I have to do this. But we make that decision every day and then it becomes a pattern and then we're better for it. So I'm hoping that we can have these practices and get them cemented into our consciousness and all be better. That seems like a great place to stop. Dr. Jasmine Constanzo, thank you so much for chatting with me. I really appreciate it. And I think that what you have to share is gonna, is gonna really resonate with a lot of people. So I really appreciate it. And one more time, jasmineohm.com. Jasmine, omm.com. There are all kinds of useful resources there and, and uh, you can learn more about Jasmine as well. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Beth.